So there's, I mean, there's a bunch of places I could go today. Um, we are currently in a series called Honey and the Rock. And for those of you who, again, this might be your first time in or you haven't heard the story, uh, the reason that we're going into a series based on this is that part of the prophetic history of this body uh, is that we have, a, we have a building just kind of down the street, several blocks on Bonita Street. So if you hear me reference Bonita, that's what I'm talking about. Um, we have a building several blocks down the street where there was a, a period of time when we first were sort of renovating the building where there was a room in that, uh, in that building that was so full of bees that we, it was literally unusable. Um, we took care of that, got that cleaned up. And then I think it was close to a decade later, uh, there was a prophetic evangelist by the name of Sean Smith who came in and he delivered this word to the house. And he said, I don't know entirely what this means, uh, but there's hun- the Lord is saying there's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. And if you've not heard or read the passage in Psalm 81, where the Lord's saying uh, to Israel that I would satisfy you with honey from the rock, you hear that phrase and you're like, that's weird. Typical weird prophet doing typical weird prophet things. Cool. But it was within the matter of, I want to say that same week, if not a couple of days later, uh, that we started to hear buzzing in the walls of Bonita. Some of you know where this is going. We started to hear buzzing in the walls of Bonita, and there were several panels worth of the wall that were again filled with bees who were all producing honey. There's honey in the rock. I love when the Lord does stuff that just makes absolutely no sense because uh, we are, as much as we can theologically agree that God's bigger than us and can do whatever he wants, we like to say that, but internally we like to keep him kind of small because that keeps him predictable and controllable. If you haven't met me yet, I just don't pull punches. So I'm just going to call it like it is. We, we like to keep God in a frame of reference where we can always expect and have a reasonable idea of what he's gonna do. But then he comes in and says, there's honey in the rock and all of a sudden bees show up in this building and there's literally honey inside of the walls of this building. And then, so we took care of that. We got that taken care of. Fast forward several more years and then just a few weeks ago, it happened again. On the one hand, you could say, maybe you guys should find a different uh, pest person because this seems to be a recurring issue. But, Something that you will start to pick up, I think the more that you're around here and also the more that you follow the Lord, um, there will be things that he uses throughout your history that's unique to you that he will use to continue to speak to you. So part of the prophetic history of this house is honey in the rock. And the fact that that is coming back up for us again after a season that we've really just now started to come out of where things were difficult, they were rocky for a minute, Um, We didn't know where the church was really going to go, but now we're coming out of that season. We're doing well. And then it's at this juncture that the Lord starts to speak again and reminds us, hey, there's honey in the rock. It's the goodness of a father who would remind you who you are and what's available to you. And again, I've got a bunch of different places I'm going to go today. Um, Something that you will end up getting used to from me if you have not already. I'm wired a little bit more prophetically. So there'll be things where I'm discerning was like, okay, the Lord's talking about this. He's talking about this. And uh, that doesn't typically jive too well when you're taught homiletics, basically preaching in seminary. They're like, you got your three points in a poem and that's how you do it. And then I'm over here like, I don't know how to fit any of this into what I'm supposed to do today, but we're going to go for it. All right. Sound good. Some of you are a little unsure. It's okay you will make it out alive. We hope anyway. <laughs> um, so with that, um, there, here's what I've been hearing the Lord say for our body. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about this. But the past several weeks, what I've been hearing the Lord say for our body, kind of the body of, of Christ at large, I think, the more people that I talk to, but what I'm hearing him say, I heard very clearly in my heart, A few weeks ago, I heard the phrase, there's a repentance that's unto reparation, and then there's a repentance that's unto preparation. 
and you are in a season of repentance unto preparation. So let me explain a little bit about what that is. Uh, reparation, if you're not familiar with that word, uh, just think repair. Uh, there's a repentance that we will go through when we've wronged the Lord, where we've sinned, where we've done something wrong, and repentance is unto God. I've gotten myself very off base, and I need to, you know, make I need to repair the relationship. I need to come back here and repent and turn towards something different. And then there's also a theme that we see throughout scripture where God calls his people to repent. And it's not just because they've sinned, but it's because God's saying where you're going and what I'm taking you into, what you've currently got, you cannot take with you into that next thing. Aaron, where do we see that? Have you heard of a story of a nation called Israel? They did this thing where they walked around in the desert for 40 long years. And as I've been studying, as I've been praying about this word and about what I believe the Lord's walking us into, and I was even praying through kind of Israel's story, one of the things that the Lord highlighted, because again, there was unbelief in them around what the Lord wanted to do. The Lord literally walked them to the doorstep of what he promised them. They saw what was in front of them and they said, I, I don't know about that. God, there's giants in the land. I thought this was supposed to be easy. I thought that when I got to the doorstep of the promise that you had for me, that I was supposed to be able to just waltz right in. It wasn't gonna require anything of me. And I was just gonna be able to you know, take the land and life was gonna be happily ever after the rest of the way through. Instead, there's giants in the land and they forget about the God who literally followed them around with a pillar of fire, gave them manna, gave them food, provided for them, got them out of slavery. They forget all of that. They see the challenge in front of them and they say, ah, it's probably not gonna happen. There was unbelief in them. And as we look at that story and as I relate it to what's God doing in this body, one of the questions we have to start asking ourselves is, God, what's in me that needs to die before I walk into the next thing? God, what's in me that needs to die before I walk into the next thing? Aaron, why is it important that we ask ourselves that question? Why do we need to think about that? That seems a little intense. I am admittedly an intense person. You will get used to it. But our country, specifically the church in America, if I'm going to get a little bit more specific, we've been plagued in recent years with leaders who rise really quickly, have a lot of gifting, and then they have a moral failing, and then they end up getting shunned. There's a lot of stuff I could say about the shunning that is not correct and how we deal with that. That's a different message. But the reason things like this happen is because they did not do the work with the Lord to kill those things that needed to die before they walked into the next that the Lord had for them. Put it another way. Your giftings, your callings, all of those things, you do not take them with you into heaven. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that where there's knowledge, it'll pass away. Where there's prophecy, it'll pass away. Where there's tongues, it'll pass away. When the perfect is come, it's talking about the day that we see Jesus face to face. And realistically, if you just think through this point by point, it makes sense that we're not gonna need those gifts. I'm not gonna need somebody with a prophetic gift to tell me what the word of the Lord is over my life because I'm gonna turn, hey, Jesus. <laughs> What do you think about this? So part of what this is, is the Lord's even so gracious to us is to help us reorient how we think about ministry, how we think about our lives, how we think about what he's actually going after because our gifts are amazing. But if we don't begin to develop with the Lord, the internal structure to actually be able to hold them well, the internal character to be able to hold them well, the gifts and anointings that God would put on your life would actually crush you. Aaron, that sounds a little intense. Again, you'll get used to it. But I want to talk to you guys just honestly from my heart and a little bit of my own story. Um, 
I grew up in this house. We started coming here when I was maybe 15, 16 years old. Um, and since, and I'm 29 now, going to be 30 in February. But pray for me, I'm about to cross, the, cross to the other side. But through all that time, um, I, I started coming here when the, the church was in a period of awakening. Um, it was intense. I, I'm talking about there were nights where the youth group would come into this room, worship would start at seven and would not end until midnight. We're talking high schoolers. And I want to take an aside to say, we oftentimes don't give high schoolers, junior hires, the credit that they're due. We make following God something that's reserved for, oh, when you get a good head on your shoulders when you're older. I have thoughts and opinions on that that are probably stronger than I should share from here, but <laughs> that was the period of awakening that I came into this church in and my background is actually cessationist. For those of you who don't know what that word means, it just means I came from a Bible-believing background that says that the, the gifts of the Spirit, and I should say more intentionally, the, the ones that would make you uncomfortable, the prophetic, healing, deliverance, tongues, that those things have ceased, that God doesn't do them anymore. So I come in, this church does not believe that, and in the middle of all that, the Lord actually starts to put gifts on my life. He starts, the, the prophetic starts to come out. The, the gifts of healing start to come out. And I'm like 18, 19 years old and all this stuff is starting to happen. But what I did not do a good enough job of was stewarding my own heart and being with Jesus in the midst of the promotion that came with those giftings being placed on my life. So fast forward many, many years. Again, the Lord is so gracious. This, was, this would have been in, 2019. I'm outside in this parking lot and the Lord speaks this phrase to me that's from uh, the story of Mary and Martha. And he says, Aaron, you've become busy with much serving. And it cuts me really deep because the context of what that passage is, is Jesus is speaking to, Mar to Martha and he's saying, hey, all the the preparations that you're doing, the getting the food ready for me, the serving, all of that, it's, it's awesome, but you're missing the fact that I'm here right now. And to apply it more specifically to my own life, I had gotten to this point where I was so enamored with keeping my gift going and what that could do for me. I had, let, I had allowed my identity to get wrapped up in that, what I could do for God, what I could do for other people. I had allowed it to get so wrapped up in that that I had to continue to operate in my gift even when the Lord would have me back up and slow down to take time to be with him. So he interrupts my life and says, you become busy with much serving. And then he asks us to go to YWAM. He asks us to leave staff, go to YWAM at the beginning of 2020. You hear 2020, you're like, that's odd. Yes, it is. We're getting there. So we do all this fundraising. We go off staff and Amanda and I have it in our heads because we heard very clearly from the Lord we were supposed to do this. We ran it through leadership. We ran it through people who spoke into our lives. They all said, yes and amen. This is something that the Lord would have you do. We go, and then I'm just so used to being in ministry, doing stuff, go, go, going. And now I'm in a YWAM DTS, Discipleship Training School, where the only thing that is required of me, and even more than that, the only thing that I am allowed to do is sit in teachings for three hours a day, five days a week, you don't lead anything. The Lord sat me down quick. And it was in the middle of all that that the Lord actually began to speak to my heart and say, Aaron, you've allowed your identity to get so wrapped up in your gifts. I remember exactly where it happened on base. I was walking down this really long flight of stairs. There's something about YWAM bases. They've all got ridiculously long flights of stairs. I don't know what that is, but I'm walking down this flight of stairs and the Lord just hits me with that. And now all of a sudden I'm in this place where I don't have the ability to even run from that. Part of where the Lord's taking us and part of what 
even is the context of Psalm 81, where he's saying, I, I've led you through the wilderness. I would satisfy you with honey from a rock. It's this wilderness season. It's this desert season where the Lord strips everything from you that would distract you from him. He strips everything from you that would get in the way of him developing you. Aaron, that sounds really unpleasant and uncomfortable. It gets even more uncomfortable. Just wait. Because again, I said 2020. 2020 rolls around. We, like we started our DTS. We're three months into it. How many of you guys remember March of 2020? It's literally the week, the exact week that we are getting ready to fly out to Berlin. Berlin was where we were going to go on mission. And all of a sudden we start getting these reports of, there's this virus that seems to be spreading really quickly. Eh, it's probably fine. It'll be good. It's spreading really, really quickly. Eh, it'll be okay. We'll probably lay hands on some people. They'll get healed. It'll be good. China's shutting its borders down. That's okay. Interesting. Progresses even further. The U.S. is shutting its borders down. They call everybody together into Ohana Court. It's just kind of the main meeting place. And they say, hey guys, we cannot risk sending a bunch of teenagers. We were the old people in the group. We can't risk sending a bunch of teenagers overseas and having them get stuck in countries away from their families. We're not doing outreach. You're all going home. It was one thing to have, you know, the ministry, the service, all that stuff get pulled away. But now I'm this mid-20s guy who is married, has a kid at the time. We've literally moved our family across an ocean to follow the word of the Lord. We have this idea of what the next you know, decade of our lives is gonna be. And then God says effectively through circumstances, now I need you to go home and live with your mom and dad for a year. <laughs> My parents, many of you guys know them, they're amazing people. It wasn't like I was walking into a, a hostile environment, but talk about the Lord addressing any sort of pride you've got left in you. And then I'm in this spot and I'm just going like, you know, we all started off really high faith at the beginning of COVID, right? It'll be done in a week. You know, like we're, we're praying, we're fasting. It's like, Lord, do it, Lord, do it. Three weeks goes by, oh, Lord, do it, Lord, do it. Four weeks goes by, I need to get a job. And so my, my degree is in Bible and theology, but again, I've got a family, so you, you do what a husband does, and it's like, I need to take the first thing that's available because I need to start making money. So I'm working in a UPS factory, just sorting packages within a month because that was really not working out well. Uh, I start doing delivery for Amazon. Um, if you deliver for Amazon or have delivered packages, like God bless you. <laughs> when I... I can laugh about it a little bit now, but when I tell you that that was soul crushing, it was soul crushing. But the Lord was taking me through a season of repentance unto what he was walking me into. Because in the middle of that season, I got this prophetic word from Joe Moody, who's somebody most of us know. She's a spiritual mom to me. She's looking at me and she says, Aaron, you don't know how much God loves the conversations that he's having with you when you're driving around in that car. And so I, I start to lean in and pay attention to that. And I, I can just remember very clearly that there was this moment where God showed me something about himself that just, I was just crying like a baby driving packages around. Everybody with their ring doorbells was probably like, what's this guy doing? He's just sobbing, <laughs> dropping packages off. <laughs> but th what he showed me doesn't maybe necessarily have anything to do with what we're talking about today, but I want to share it just because I love talking about it. We, we don't have a context for how humble Jesus really is. We're talking about the God of the universe somehow shrunk himself down without sacrificing any of himself, by the way, shrunk himself down and became a baby. 
he didn't become a man fully formed in his 30s. The God of the universe shrunk himself down into a baby, had to go through the developmental process and completely trust his body and his life to these two people that he created. And what the one that got me was, again, he's having to develop like a normal human being would. He's, he's growing, he's hitting puberty, he's having to learn things. His father was a carpenter by trade. So the, the, the picture and the, the scene that God just like shoved into my heart and wrecked me was, I saw Jesus walking up to Joseph. He's holding these like materials in his hand. He's saying, hey, dad, could you show me how to build this? We're talking about the one who used nothing other than the power of his voice to speak the wood that he's holding in his hands into existence. And he's walking up to Joseph and saying, hey, can you teach me? Can you show me? We have no grid for the humility of this man that we're following. But that humility is also why we can trust him. We're used to people who have all the power in the world and have an agenda and they're charismatic and it's like, this is where we're going to go. But thank God that the one who's actually got all the power and who's leading us is the person who's humble enough to do that. Understandably, I was a wreck. <laughs> but even in the middle of all of that, God was stripping me of so much showing me who he was. There, there's a, some of you will be able to identify with this, but there, there's a verse or a series of verses, I should say, in the middle of Jesus's story in the gospels where he's just given his very famous uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood sermon. He basically, uh, the father found a way for him to preach the most offensive message possible. At the height of his ministry, no less. He's got literally thousands of people following him around and he gets up and preaches this message that they interpret as, hey, cannibalism is a cool idea. We, of course, know that that's not what he was talking about on the other side of it. But for them in their context, they're like, what are you talking about? Eat your flesh and drink your blood. We're out. This guy's, I don't know what's up with this guy. He turns and looks at his disciples and he says, are you, are you guys going to leave too? Not accusatory, but he's like, hey, if you, if you want to leave, like you can leave. And this is what I think the Lord wants to develop in his people. And it's certainly what got developed in me in that season. The disciples response is, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Christ, the Holy One of God. In a season where the Lord's asking us to repent of things into a unto being prepared for the things that he's wanting us to walk into as a body. It can be very easy to get caught up in this idea of repentance as being, and I'm going to attack this in a minute. In Western church culture, we have this idea of repentance being God essentially grabbing you by the neck and shoving your face down into what you've done and saying, you need to feel really bad about this. And so because that's the idea that we've got of who God is. And that's really what this is all about. It's about, it's a war over the character of the father because we've got this idea of who God is. We, we essentially try to do his job for them then. And we, you know, immediately start beating ourselves up internally. How could I be so stupid? How could I do all of this? And we, we make the goal of repentance in our own minds being, I just need to feel awful. I need to use shame, guilt as a way to motivate myself to never want to do this again. What does the scripture say? It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And in the middle of that season where the Lord's stripping you of those things and pointing things out, keep in mind, it's a good father who's doing it. I believe it's Hebrews 5, where it talks about the, the marks of a true son. The marks of a true son or daughter of God is you can stand up under correction. One of the ways that we know that the father actually loves us and cares about us is he is 
unwilling to let us be stuck in sins and soul patterns and cycles that keep us harming ourselves and the people around us. You guys understand that that's why he actually hates sin, right? Most of us have this conception of sin and we think about it in terms of God said it's bad, so it's bad and I need to feel bad for doing it. You could leave it at that and in one sense you would be correct. But here's the thing, God's not just after servants, he's after friends. He doesn't need servants, he has those. He has angels, he has people who can carry out his will perfectly, who, who don't have the same opinions that we do, <laughs> who aren't stubborn like we are. He's not after you just being this perfect little robot. He's after a relationship with you. Okay, if that's the case, then we get to actually go back and ask the father, okay, God, I understand that you don't like this thing in my life and you want me to get rid of it. Why? What is it doing to me? This is an easier one for, for us to speak to. We, a lot of us understand that scripture, the Lord, you know, says sex is saved for the confines of marriage. We get that. And we're like, cool, don't do sex outside of marriage. We often leave it at that. But we never stop to ask the question, Lord, why is that? Because God would not have you binding yourself to a person, heart, soul, and body, in a context that has no covenant to protect it. What's happening when you give yourself to a person in that way, I'm just taking this little tangent here to illustrate a point. When you bind yourself to a person in that way, you have, the, 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 scripture, the scriptural picture for it is it, it's a mingling of souls. It's the, the deepest part of who you are is getting melded with the deepest part of who this person is. And so if we're just casual with that and we you know, go into that outside of the context of marriage where I've made a covenant with my partner to say I'm with you for life regardless of what happens, then now all of a sudden you're binding yourself to all these different people and having that ripped away time after time. There's healing for that. There's forgiveness for that. And the Lord would have it such that you never have to go through that. So when we're talking about repentance, when we're talking about asking the Lord, Lord, why do you want me to let go of these things? What do you have against this stuff that you're pointing out in my life? It's because he actually has something better for you. We're very often like Israel. We're caught up in the slavery, the familiarity of our own bondage. And then the moment the Lord starts to lead us into something that looks different and free, and it starts to cost us something, it starts to feel uncomfortable, it starts to require something of us that we didn't expect. We go, man, slavery wasn't that bad though. I got three meals a day. I got to exercise plenty. Like maybe, what if we just went back? Another way to think of this is, didn't plan on talking about any of this, but here we are. Another way to think about this is, uh, how many of you guys have seen the movie Shawshank Redemption? Plenty of us in here. Many of you know exactly where I'm going with this if you've watched the movie. There was an inmate who was a part of the, the story, the narrative as a whole. I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now. But he had been in the system for decades. He had basically, if I'm remembering correctly, he had gone into prison when he was maybe a teenager and he was now an old man. He had spent more time in prison than out of prison. So he finally gets off on parole and he so doesn't know how to live life outside of the rules of prison, outside of that bondage, outside of all of that. Like he, he, he doesn't even understand the, the, the level of freedom that He's talking to his store manager that he, he got a job he, at a grocery store. He's talking to his store manager and he's asking him like every five minutes, like, hey, can I, can I use the restroom? The guy has to pull him aside and say like, hey, you, you don't have to ask me every time you need to do that. But he's so messed up in his head, so used to the bondage that he literally doesn't know how to handle freedom and he ends up taking his own life. So 
So when the Lord's inviting us into repentance, it's a gift. And when he's inviting us into repentance, we need to understand, I may not have the full picture of why he's going after this thing in my life right now, but God, I know who you are. I know what you're like. I know that if you're asking me to lay this stuff down, it's because you have something more for me on the other end of this. Amen. Scripture talks about a God who gives us exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. Do you understand that part of living in the kingdom of God means you get to actually start to experience more than you could ask, think, or imagine on this side of eternity? Scripture says this is eternal life to know God and his, son, and his son who he has sent. So eternal life isn't just when you pass away and go into heaven. Eternal life starts with knowing the Father and all of the things that come, to et come with eternal life begins with you starting to know God. And one of the core ways, one of the core things that happens when you begin to do that is you'll come into contact with this God who's so holy, so in love with you, so much bigger than you could have thought. And now all of a sudden, when you're in his presence, these things start to get pointed out. You're like, man, this does not, I used to not care about this. I used to be able to just give you personal context. I used to be able to just ignore my emotions, my anger, all this stuff, and just shove it down and pretend it wasn't there. But now that I am in your presence, I can't ignore the fact that that's there. You're putting your finger on that and it's making me really uncomfortable, but I don't want to leave this place. So if I can't leave and this thing is here and making me uncomfortable, then that thing's gonna be what, what has to leave. What happens, I, bouncing all over the place, but track with me. What happens with the prophet Isaiah? He sees God in all of his glory. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth when he's in the presence of God like that, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. He, the first thing that comes to his mind when he's in the presence of the glory of God in that extreme way is like, I, I wow, I need help. And again, we talk about a repentance unto a preparation. God doesn't in that moment say, yeah, you're right. You're awful. He doesn't launch into a tirade about how Isaiah isn't everything that he should have been. He cleanses him. An angel grabs a coal, puts it on his mouth and says, okay, you are a man of unclean lips. Now that I've dealt with that, let's move forward. Now that I've dealt with that, let's move forward. Most of us have a conception of the gospel that leaves us in this place. Again, what I was talking about earlier, I just need to sit here and feel bad about my sin until Jesus comes back. Do you recognize that he paid for more than that? Do you recognize that him dealing with sin in your life is unto the God who made you being able to have full communion with you. He is so crazy about you, so wants to know you, so wants to be a part of the milliseconds of your life that he says, I need to, I need to be here, I need to be with you. And for me to do that even more closely than I am now, there's stuff in your life that we have to get rid of. Which is why a season of repentance is a glorious thing. I'm gonna hit just a few practical things. I know I've been going on. I'm gonna hit a few practical things because I can just go on and on and on, but I wanna help make this practical. How many of you guys know that the prophetic only is helpful if it starts to become practical? Yeah. So just to really quickly define repentance and then sort of what even conviction is along, along with that. The Greek word for repentance is this word metanoia. You can hear echoes of the word metamorphosis in there. Again, pictures of a caterpillar metamorphosing into a butterfly. And it's this idea of making an about face. It's you're going one direction, now I'm gonna go another direction. 
Ephesians even talks about this a little bit. It, it, Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus and saying, be, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new man who's clothed with righteousness and put off the old man who's clothed in unrighteousness. So repentance then actually becomes super practical because it's not just about you feeling bad internally about choices that you've made. It's you partnering with the Lord, using your will to say, God, I've been doing things one way. I'm gonna think about this a different way and start to live my life in that different way. Yeah. Ephesians 4, here's your homework. Read Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 goes through this list and Paul's saying, okay, if you're a thief, now you're not allowed to steal anymore, but he doesn't stop there. He says, you should work with your own hands so that you have enough to provide for yourself and even a little bit to give. So repentance then is not just, I'm gonna harp on it again and again. It's not just you feeling bad about what you did. It's saying, God, show me how to live different. And that is what will prepare you to walk into the next thing. So it's not just, God, I have an anger issue. Help me to not be angry. It's, God, I have an anger issue. How do I actually start to bless the people in my life that I feel anger towards? It's not just, God, I have a selfishness issue. Please help me to not be selfish. It's, God, I have a selfishness issue. Show me how to be selfless with my time, energy, money to bless the people around me. That's what scripturally is the true work of repentance. That's what God's inviting us into. Don't just feel bad, think differently, live differently. That's the invitation. And with that, oh, conviction. This is a good one. It's an important one. <laughs> I had a lot of fun uh, with the Lord learning about this one. Um, how many of you guys, when you hear the word conviction, um, it's got like negative overtones for you? You can lose the religiosity hat. You know, yeah, I know we're in church, but it's like, okay, conviction sounds scary. Would rather not feel that. Okay. I can remember the one of the moments where I first felt genuine conviction from the Holy Spirit. I had just, I think I had just gone off on one of my friends. I was angry. I had been sarcastic and I was closing the door of my card again. And as soon as I close it, it's like the most gentle, I don't know how, the best words for it is it was gentle, but it was sharp. The presence of God fills the car and it's just this gentle but sharp thing. And I know I am so loved, but I was so wrong. Again, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So again, being in a season where the Lord's having us repent from things unto heading into the next thing. If you start to feel shame and condemnation, that's where you begin to ask Holy Spirit. Okay, Holy Spirit, separate what's true from what's a lie here. It's literally as simple as that. Holy Spirit, separate what's true from what's a lie. Because conviction, it's like the most gentle spanking you've ever <laughs> received in your life is the best way I can explain it. You, you walk away from that conversation and it was, for those of you who are sort of like me, you don't love confrontation, you walk away from that and you're like, wait a minute, I just got rebuked, didn't I? <laughs> like, and the Lord will begin to deal with us in, in that way. And that's how he deals with his sons. It's not to say that he won't be stern. It's not to say that there won't be moments where he's like, look, you're doing this, you need to stop. Again, if any of you have kids, that makes so much sense to you. But the enemy wins in this situation if we begin to confuse conviction with condemnation. Because what does condemnation do? I will tell you. Condemnation just keeps you in the same cycle that you've been stuck in. You ever notice that when you give into shame and condemnation, you never actually get better? When you give into shame and condemnation, you just end up white knuckling your problem. I'm just going to try really hard not to sin. And you end up doing the same thing. The same condemnation comes up. You make yourself feel terrible and you go back to the same thing. 
part of what is different about conviction is that with it, the Lord actually empowers you to do the different living that he's calling you to. I'm giving you guys a lot today. We tracking? We good? Okay, so again, the prophetic is not helpful unless it's practical. So I'm gonna break it down into a few practical things for us. And it's gonna come down to questions to ask the Lord. Um, if somebody wants to come up and play piano, I don't know if that was the, that was part of the plan. I can do it without if you want, but questions to ask God, prayers to pray to the Lord. The first one, it's a simple one and it's scripture. Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know me. I'm paraphrasing here a little bit. Search me, O God, know me. See if there's any anxious way within me. Know my heart. It's inviting God. God, I am not a good judge of myself. I need you to look at me. You point out what needs to change. You point out what needs to go. And because he's a good father who speaks to his children, he will speak. Asking him the question, God, search me. What's in me? Again, asking a very practical question. God, why does this offend you? A lot of us grew up in homes where asking mom and dad why was tantamount with just blatant disrespect. <laughs> this is not that. Again, God wants relationship with you. It's not about you saying, I need you to prove to me that this is wrong. It's about saying, Father, I want to understand your heart. God, why does this offend you? Because the more you start to understand that, the more you actually don't want to go back to the thing he's asking you to give up. Again, practical question. Lord, how do I live different? Holy Spirit is insanely practical. Just to speak personally for what's going on in my own life as I've been starting along this journey, one of the things that the Lord has been addressing in me is selfishness. I really like things when I settle into a rhythm, I like for things to be the way they are. I like knowing that my needs can get met in a certain way at a certain time. And then when life gets busy and my wife has a business that's, that God's blessing and more opportunities are coming up for her. That means she's gone more. And then I'm over here having a little grown up temper tantrum to myself about how like, oh, but I don't get my needs met when I want, like, uh. I'm doing that whole thing. And so as I'm going through this process, like, okay, Lord, what do I do different? I knew like, this one's sort of a no brainer, but at the same time, God was very specific with me. How many husbands know that your, your life is better if your wife can come home to a clean house? <laughs> All the wives said, amen. <laughs> so I knew that cleaning needed to happen, but the Lord says, tomorrow you do this and you get this stuff taken care of before you do the stuff that you want to do with your time. Again, repentance, very practical. Holy Spirit, very practical. So you ask him, Lord, what do I, how, how do I live different? What do I need to do to live different? And then another good question to ask that fits in with what we've been talking about. God, what's in me now that I can't take with me into the next season? God, what's in me now that I can't take with me where you're leading me? Here's the thing. I'm a, I, I know we've talked about stuff that people traditionally consider like a heavy topic. I am, I am excited about this season for us. I am excited about a season where the Lord starts to point things out. Because part of, just to get, again, very practical, part of what that means, if the Lord's pointing things out in your heart that need to change, it means he's not done with you. It means he has not given up on you. And it means he is not leaving you alone. And can I make one more observation about this? Don't go through this process alone. Don't go through this process alone. 
Scripture even talks about in James, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. There's a healing that comes from the Lord, both physically sometimes and in your soul when you start to confess, hey, I'm dealing with this. God's putting his finger on this. And what's healing about that, so many of us have rejection issues and fear of rejection. When you start confessing these things to people and you realize that they actually don't view you any different, that will heal something in you so deep. Don't do this alone. Again, God's not just doing this with individuals. He's doing this with us as a community. So don't do this alone. If you would stand, I'm going to pray for us. If you just close your eyes, just hold your hands out in front of you, just whatever you need to do to put your self in a position to receive. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you that you're good. We thank you that you're here. Father, right now in Jesus' name, we choose as a body to break agreement with the lie that repentance is a scary thing. We choose to break agreement with the lie that I need to do this on my own. God, we break agreement with the pride that would say that I can do this on my own. I'm gonna have us just pray this with me. Just say in the name of Jesus, I break agreement with shame and condemnation. I refuse to believe that God motivates me through shame. I choose to believe it's the kindness of God that leads me into repentance. Search me, God know my heart. Show me what needs to change. Father, we thank you that you're good. God, I thank you for your people. I thank you for your people. God, I bless your children. I bless you in the name of Jesus to know that your father loves you. I bless you in the name of Jesus to know that you can walk forward into the season with God at your side. I bless you to know that God loves you so much that he refuses to leave you alone. And I bless you to know that you're walking into something new with the Father in this season. And I bless you to know that he loves you. In Jesus' name, amen.